May 10th, 2007, in the tranquil village of Kujim, Czech Republic, an ordinary evening took a chilling turn for a hopeful father. Eager to ensure the safety of his newborn, he carefully installed a CCTV baby monitor, unknowingly setting in motion a sequence of events that would haunt him forever. As he peered expectantly at the monitor's display, anticipating the serene sight of his slumbering child in the crib, the CCTV picked up a different signal nearby. A shocking and horrifying scene unfurled before his eyes. A young boy, barely dressed, with his fragile limbs cruelly restrained behind his back. The boy looked very thin and weak, and he was desperately trying to find food on the floor. His malnourished appearance sent shivers down the father's spine, leaving him with unsettling questions. From which of his neighbors was the video feed coming from? Who was the young boy captured on the baby monitor's screen? Hello and welcome back to Mysterious 7. Today we're looking at the case of Clara Marova, the cannibal mother. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please consider hitting the subscribing button and the bell icon below. So, without further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Kujim is a charming town located in Brno County District in the South Moravian region of the Czech Republic. With a population of approximately 11,000 as of today, it offers a close-knit community vibe. This quaint destination boasts cultural landmarks like the Kujim Castle and the Church of St. Mary Magdalene, drawing history enthusiasts from far and wide. And here, our story begins. Back in 2005, in the small town of Kujim, Czech Republic, there lived two sisters, 31-year-old Clara Marova, born 1975, and 33-year-old Katerina Marova. Not much is known about their early lives, but Clara had a degree in pedagogy, the study of the methods and activities of teaching. Katerina, on the other hand, worked at a youth center called Papsek. What intrigued those who knew them was the deep belief the sisters shared. They often spoke about a divine mission that awaited them, a calling from God that would shape their destinies. Now, Clara was also a single mother who found herself with the responsibility of taking care of two boys, Jacob, age nine, and his younger brother, Andre, who was eight. Clara had been married before, but the details about her husband, the duration of their marriage, and the circumstances of their separation remain unclear. Some attributed the breakup to what was labeled as Clara's unusual behavior and beliefs, which were thought to be related to her battle with schizophrenia. Despite the challenges she faced, those who knew Clara had nothing but praise for her motherly nature. She was the epitome of a loving and caring mother, always taking proper care of Jacob and Andre. Clara delighted in playing with them, taking them on exciting vacations, and enrolling them in summer camps to create beautiful memories. However, the tranquil life they'd built together began to change when a new child entered their lives. From that moment on, life would never be the same for Clara, Jacob, and Andre. The new child was a 13-year-old Norwegian orphan named Annika. She had an interesting connection with Katerina, Clara's sister, who somehow took her under her wing. We don't know all the details of how they met, but it's possible they crossed paths at the youth center where Katerina worked. One day, Katerina decided to visit her sister Clara, and she took Annika along with her. Now, this wasn't just any ordinary visit, because Annika had quite a tale to share. She bravely revealed that she was running away from a dangerous trafficking gang in Norway. The poor girl had endured severe hardships at the hands of these criminals. As Annika shared her heart-wrenching story, Clara couldn't help but feel a rush of sympathy and concern. It was a moment that brought the family together, connecting them to this young girl in need. As days turned into weeks, Annika's presence in Clara's home grew stronger. She also portrayed herself as a frail and sickly child, requiring constant medical attention. It was peculiar, though, as she only trusted Katerina to take her to the hospital. It makes one wonder about the reason behind the selective trust. Despite the mystery surrounding Annika, Clara's heart softened towards her, and she wholeheartedly embraced the young girl as part of her family. Annika had found a loving and caring mother figure in Clara, and the bond between them continued to grow. But amidst this new chapter in their lives, something else was brewing on the horizon. The two sisters, Clara and Katerina, joined a cult known as the Grail Movement. This cult was under the guidance of a man named Joseph Skorla. The members of the cult held a belief that performing good deeds could secure them a place in heaven, while simultaneously granting them immunity from the repercussions of any crimes committed. It's not exactly clear how, when, or under what circumstances Clara and Katerina joined this group. 
Now, as the two sisters ventured further into the folds of the Grail movement, they would soon discover that their newfound beliefs came with unforeseen consequences. The cult's allure would pull them into a world where the line between right and wrong became blurred. Shortly after Annika became a part of the family, strange texts and emails began flooding Clara's phone. These messages were from an unknown sender claiming to be a doctor with a perfect treatment plan for Annika. The messages were cryptic yet compelling, urging Clara to meet this mysterious doctor in person to discuss Annika's care. Curiosity got the best of her, and they arranged to meet late at night inside a car. On the day of the meeting, Clara could not get a clear look at the man's face since it was dark. However, he presented Annika's medical records and even flashed a diplomatic passport, which somewhat reassured Clara about his credibility. Feeling a sense of trust in the stranger, Clara accepted him as Annika's new and official doctor. However, little did she know that this encounter would set off a chain of unsettling events. As time passed, the texts and emails from the doctor took a strange turn. He'd suggest bizarre treatment plans, like instructing her to rub Annika's body, especially her private regions, for hours, claiming it would bring happiness to the young girl. This was simply weird, to say the least. As the days went by, something changed in Clara. Her attention seemed to drift away from her sons, and so she began leaving them in the care of their grandparents. This shift in focus coincided with Clara's growing idea of adopting Annika into their family. However, a strange twist came into play when the doctor, who'd been sending those mysterious messages, told Clara that adoption would be impossible due to her son's alleged mistreatment of Annika. It's unclear whether this accusation held any truth or if it was just a manipulation tactic. With her heart torn and unsure of what to do, Clara turned to the doctor for advice. Shockingly, he suggested a rather disturbing solution to her dilemma. Curing her son's evil spirits through extreme discipline, tough love, and physical punishments. In a twist that nobody saw coming, Clara began to discipline her sons with relentless severity, as if she were seeking any excuse to inflict pain upon them. It was shocking and heartbreaking to witness. She resorted to beating them with her bare hands, wooden spoons and belts, and even subjected them to the cruelty of being locked up in small rooms overnight. It was difficult to comprehend how Clara's actions had taken such a dark turn. Perhaps her struggle with schizophrenia played a part, clouding her judgment and making it easier for her to carry out these drastic measures. Regardless of what it was, Clara's family was now entangled in a web of pain and turmoil. The once-loving mother seemed lost, as if consumed by a darkness that had engulfed her soul. The path ahead held an uncertain future for everyone involved, and the question remained whether there would be a way to break free from this disturbing cycle of pain and find the light amidst the shadows that had taken hold. In August of 2006, something bizarre and troubling happened. The doctor who'd been advising Clara about her sons dropped a bombshell. He said her punishments weren't working, and in a surprising turn of events, he suggested an even more radical approach. Clara should stop acting like their mother altogether. It was an astonishing and bewildering idea, but Clara followed the doctor's instructions nonetheless. That's not even the craziest part. The doctor also suggested she take them to this small cottage in Verveska Batishka, out in the woods, far away from prying eyes. This remote spot was a mere 13-minute drive from their home in Kujim. Clara was torn between this bizarre advice and her desperate need to fix her sons. However, in the end, she decided to go along with it. She packed her boys up and whisked them away to that secluded cottage. Upon reaching the cottage, they were met by Katerina, Clara's sister, along with two men. One was named Jan Skla, while the other was named Jan Turek. Another woman, Hanna Bashova, whom Clara knew from a past summer camp, was also part of the group. This seemingly innocent gathering at the cottage would mark the beginning of an unthinkable ordeal for the two young boys. The cottage walls would bear witness to unspeakable horrors and unimaginable acts of cruelty afflicted upon the innocent souls who deserved nothing but love and care. The boys were kept locked up inside tiny dog cages. The cages were so small they couldn't even stand up properly or move around much. And to add to the cruelty, they were forced to eat from dog bowls and use the bathroom right there in the cages, leaving them sitting in their own filth. But it didn't stop at that. The boys were forbidden to talk to each other, to their own mother or to anyone else present. The mental torture was simply unbearable. And then came the water torture. 
Clara would dunk their heads underwater for what felt like an eternity. The boys were terrified, thinking they might drown. And to make matters worse, Katerina would hold their arms behind their backs, leaving them defenseless against their own mother's cruelty. It was just sickening to think about the pain and suffering those boys endured. They were scratched with forks and subjected to unimaginable ordeals. They were forced to fight each other, tied up like animals. And it wasn't just Clara and Katerina that carried out this abuse on the boys. The others joined in too. They would tie bags around the boys' heads, cutting off their air and further tormenting them. But the horrors didn't stop there. At one point, they even cut flesh from Andre's buttocks and burned the wound with cigarettes. And, unbelievably, they made him eat his own flesh. The others also had joined in eating the raw human flesh. The depravity of it all is just beyond words. They didn't stop at just one act of savagery. They continued taking skin from other parts of the boys' bodies, forcing them to eat their own flesh. And if that wasn't enough, they even made them eat their vomit. The boys' screams must have been unbearable, so they made sure to tape their mouths shut to silence them. The following month, in September of 2006, Clara decided to pursue the adoption of Annika once again, and this time her efforts were successful. Following this, Clara made a shocking decision to hand over her own sons to Katerina. She thought it would be better to focus solely on caring for Annika, whom she believed needed extra attention. So the boys moved out to live with their aunt. But in January 2007, things took a dark and terrifying turn. The boys and Katerina moved back in with Clara, and that's when the nightmare began anew. This time, their abuse was even worse. Clara locked them up in a cement cellar, like they were prisoners in their own home. It was like the horrors from the cottage followed them back, haunting their every step. To make matters even more distressing, Clara installed a TV baby monitor in the cellar, enabling her to observe and relish in the suffering of her own sons from the comfort of her kitchen. All the while, Annika lived in a completely different world, her own bedroom brightly lit and filled with toys. It was like she was living in a different reality, oblivious to the torment her brothers were enduring. For several months, the boys remained chained in that dark, desolate cellar. They were trapped in a cycle of suffering, and there seemed to be no escape for them. As fate would have it, May 10th, 2007 became the day when the truth that had been hidden for far too long finally came to light. It all began when a man named Edward, who lived close to Clara's family home, set up a CCTV baby monitor for his newborn son. Baby monitors can sometimes be glitchy and pick up signals from nearby monitors, and that's exactly what happened on that fateful day. Instead of seeing his own son's crib on the monitor, Edward was met with a disturbing sight. There was a young boy, completely naked, with his arms and legs tied up behind his back. The young boy he saw was Andre. He looked dirty, unhealthy, and was eating off the floor. And there was a woman's hand feeding him. Edward was understandably alarmed and wasted no time in calling the police. The authorities went door to door, determined to find the source of this disturbing footage. When they reached Clara's home, things took a sinister turn. Clara and Katerina refused to open a locked door within their house. This raised serious concerns, so the firemen stepped in, breaking down the door. What they found inside was nothing short of a nightmare. There were the two boys, battered and malnourished, locked away like prisoners in a cement cellar. Clara and Katerina were swiftly arrested for their horrifying actions. The two boys, along with Annika, were then taken to a children's home called Cloak Neck. Days later, Annika disappeared from the children's home. As the investigation progressed, the authorities stumbled upon a revelation that shook the very foundation of the case. Annika, the supposed 13-year-old girl, was not who she claimed to be. In a startling twist, it was uncovered that Annika was, in fact, a 33-year-old woman named Barbara Sklorova. Barbara had been able to deceive everyone by exploiting her condition called hypopituitarism, which made her appear much younger and smaller than her actual age. It was a cunning ploy that allowed her to assume the identity of a vulnerable teenager and gain entry into Clara's family. Barbara's deception added a new layer of intrigue to the unfolding story. It raised questions about her true intentions and the reasons behind her infiltration into Clara's family. The truth was far more complex than anyone had anticipated, and the authorities now had to untangle the web of deceit surrounding this mysterious woman. For eight long months, her whereabouts remained a mystery, leaving everyone wondering what had become of her. Then, out of the blue, 
she resurfaced in the city of Tromsø, Norway. As the pieces of her journey were put together, it was revealed that after fleeing the children's home, she first went to Denmark before finding her way to Oslo, Norway. To successfully enter Norway undetected, she used the passport of a 13-year-old boy named Adam Falner, which had been supplied by the boy's parents. In an astonishing display of deception, Adam's parents went to great lengths to convince authorities that Barbara was, in fact, their son. To add further credibility, Adam's father, Martin Farner, even accompanied Barbara to Norway, reinforcing the illusion. Once in Norway, she assumed the identity of Adam. She took extreme measures, shaving her head and concealing her true self to deceive teachers, police, and childcare workers who were all unsuspecting of her real age. With her new persona, she managed to gain admission into a school. However, it wasn't long before history repeated itself, and she ran away once again. She found refuge in a Norwegian children's home. Then, on December 16, 2007, she mysteriously vanished from the home. Eventually, she was found, on January 5, 2008, and her true identity was exposed. With this, the authorities learned the shocking truth around the woman posing as a young boy. She was subsequently deported back to the Czech Republic to face charges related to her fraudulent identity and to be put on trial for her involvement in the abuse of the innocent children of the family she'd once pretended to be a part of. Additionally, the man who aided her, Martin Farno, faced his own reckoning. He was arrested and confronted with charges in Norway for providing false testimony in support of her deceitful act. During the trial, which took place in June 2008, Barbara claimed that her actions were driven by a desire to escape her own troubled life. However, she denied any participation in the abuse of Andre and Jacob. According to her, she was also a victim of Clara and Katerina's violence. Despite her claims, her defense was met with skepticism, and few believed her side of the story. During the court proceedings, Clara tearfully confessed to torturing her sons. She, however, claimed that she'd been under the influence of the mysterious figure known only as the Doctor. She told the court about how this doctor had manipulated her through text messages, instructing her on the abuse and torture she could inflict on her boys. However, the police later made a startling discovery. There was no doctor at all. The phone number linked to the man actually belonged to none other than Katerina, Clara's own sister. It became apparent that Katerina had played a cunning role in this dark saga. Evidence suggested that Katerina had known about Barbara's true identity long before she introduced her to the family as the supposed 13-year-old Annika. Instead of revealing the truth to her sister, she deliberately kept the secret hidden, knowing full well how easily Clara could be manipulated. It was a sinister plan that had far-reaching consequences, leading to the suffering of innocent children at the hands of those they should have been able to trust the most. The courtroom was left grappling with the shocking revelations as everyone tried to understand the motives behind such distressing actions. Now, brace yourself for the strangest twist in this already perplexing tale. It turned out that Joseph Skra, the leader of the cult known as the Grail Movement, was actually Barbara's biological father. As the pieces fell into place, it became clear that Joseph had played a significant role in the events that transpired. He was the one who provided the documents shown to Clara that fateful night inside the car. But that wasn't all. Jan Skra, one of the men whom Clara had encountered at the cottage at Verveska Batishka, where her sons had endured unimaginable torture, turned out to be Barbara's brother. The shocking revelations only added to the already chaotic and messy affair. Whether Joseph was found or not remains a mystery. Yet justice had its say for the others involved. Clara was sentenced to nine years in prison, while Katerina received a ten-year sentence. The remaining individuals connected to the cottage ordeal were handed sentences ranging from five to seven years. Barbara, who had also played a pivotal role in the disturbing events, was sentenced to five years behind bars. However, she was released after serving half of her sentence, thanks to her lawyer's successful argument about her deteriorating psychological well-being during her time in prison. The judge also imposed five years of probation on Barbara following her release from prison. The fate of the two boys, Jacob and Andre, remains unclear but there are rumors that they were eventually adopted by an American family. In the aftermath of this harrowing case, the children's lives were forever altered by the haunting experiences they endured. The scars of their traumatic past would undoubtedly leave a profound impact on their journey into adulthood. As they embark on the path of healing, one can't help but ponder, will they ever find solace and rebuild their lives after enduring such darkness? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. 
Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel. Stay safe, and thanks for watching.